Okay, now that you know a little bit about groundwater systems, some of the vocabulary associated with them, let's talk about groundwater flow. Groundwater is usually not stagnant. Okay, it's usually moving. It isn't moving fast like a stream, but it is usually moving, and typical flow rates would be on the order of about a half a meter per day. It flows away from areas where it enters aquifers uh, to places where water exits aquifers. We call places where water enters an aquifer recharge areas, and places where water exits aquifers are referred to as discharge areas. So you can say that water flows from recharge areas to discharge areas, and that's what's shown on the slide. The blue lines depict groundwater flow paths, uh, and you can see that some of these flow paths are fairly short. The shortest ones, um, groundwater can flow along in a matter of days. Others, however, are quite long. Uh, water can be isolated from the, sub, uh, from the surface in aquitards and aquitar aquifers for thousands of years or, or even more. Some research um, recently identified some groundwater that was at least as old as 1.5 billion years old. Okay, it had been isolated in the subsurface for that long, which is incredible. Okay, so that, that would definitely be exceptional. So what controls the movement of groundwater through rocks and sediment? Well, the equation that we use to describe the flow of water through porous materials like sand was uh, defined by this guy, Henri Darcy. And the equation that he used, or that he defined, is known as Darcy's Law. So at some point he must have asked the question, what the heck controls the movement of water through sand? And I imagine that we've all asked that question a time or two. Although he probably would have said it in French, because he was, um, he was actually a French engineer. Uh, just to give you a little bit of historical context on this topic, uh, he was an engineer and he lived about the same period of time as Abraham Lincoln. Uh, during his life he was very famous for bringing a water distribution system to Dijon in 1840. Okay, this was a big deal because very few places at the time had water distribution systems. It wasn't. Uh, it was also at this time that few places had sewer systems. Okay, so if you were living in a city, a good reliable source of clean water was really important. Uh, for reference, Paris didn't have. Oops, Paris didn't have a water distribution system until 1865, a full 25 years after the little city of Dijon. Uh, got its water distribution system. It wasn't until very late in his life, about two years before he died, that he carried out the experiments that perhaps he is best known for today. He performed the experiments in a hospital, and that might seem like a really odd choice, but at the time there probably weren't many places where uh, that were you know convenient for setting up experiments. The experiment that he performed, uh, he, he published the results in this report in 1856, and uh, they were just described in a couple of pages in the very back of the report. I think one of the appendices for the uh, for the report. Uh, so it was very much just an afterthought, but it turned out to be a, a really useful and important piece of work. So what we're going to do now is walk through some aspects of Darcy's experiment. This will help illustrate some basic controls on the movement of water through porous media and also the process of science, how you can apply some basic reasoning, collect data, and then figure out relationships. So what Darcy did was uh, set up a tube that contained some sand, uh, and that tube had some smaller tubes in it called manometers, poking into the near the inflow and outflow end. And he flowed water through the sand tube and uh, observed how different variables affected flow. Hydraulic head is the name given to the height that water rises in the manometers relative to some arbitrary datum. In natural environments we would typically pick sea level to be the datum. In a lab experiment you might just pick the, the bench top where you're carrying out the experiment because it's more convenient. Hydraulic head is the sum of two components. The height that water rises in the tube as a result of water pressure, we call that pressure head, and then the height that the water has because of how far 
the tube is above the datum. Okay, so that would be elevation head. What Darcy observed was that water always flows from high head to low head, okay, and that the rate of flow through that sand tube is proportional to the difference in hydraulic head measured between the manometers. In other words, delta H. Uh, the difference between this, this uh, hydraulic head and this hydraulic head is delta H right here. Okay. How about column area? How would this affect flow? Well, this is really, really straightforward. Basically, if you were to put a partition in the column such that the area available to flow uh, was divided in two, the flow rate uh, through each half of the sand tube would be equal to one half of the total flow. Okay, so from this, Darcy concluded that the rate of flow is proportional to the area of sand available. Lastly, what about the length of the tube? Well, Darcy figured out that if you keep the head difference between each end of the tube the same, but you lengthen the tube, uh, it affects the flow rate. Okay. Uh, so imagine, in fact, it, it causes flow rate to decrease. Imagine that this sand tube is one foot long and that the difference in head is six inches. Okay, that's a pretty steep change in hydraulic head over the, over the length of that tube. Right? And so water would want to flow through that fairly quickly. But if the tube were 10 feet long, that 6 inch drop over 10 feet isn't nearly as steep. In that case, the water wouldn't move through as fast. Okay, So from this, we can conclude that uh, the length, the flow through the tube is inversely proportional to length. In other words, if all else is the same, as length increases, flow decreases. Okay, so these three lines summarize what we've just dis just discussed. Flow is directly proportional to the uh, difference in hydraulic head between each end of the tube. Uh, it's proportional to the area of the column, and it's inversely proportional to the length of the column. Okay, this symbol right here is uh, means proportional. Right? So this means inversely proportional because it's 1 over L. So if we put this together, okay, this is what we get. Now we can replace this proportional sign with a sign with an equal sign by adding a constant of proportionality k. And when we do that, this is what we get. Okay? And if we just rearrange this a little bit, we end up with this form of the equation, and that is Darcy's law. So it really is not that complicated. If you understood each part each of the parts that we went through in the previous slides, this just combines them all into one equation. Uh, one of the things that might seem a little mysterious is this K. What the heck is K? Well, K is hydraulic conductivity. So let me explain this a little bit. Um, basically, you can think of it as, you know, basically the same thing as permeability. It's a little bit different, but think about it, think about it as, as permeability. Aquifers have high hydraulic conductivity um, because uh, they can transmit water relatively easily. Water can flow through them. They're, they're fairly permeable. Right? Aquitards have low hydraulic conductivity. They're relatively impermeable. Water does not flow th through them very easily. In reality, hydraulic conductivity is a little bit more than permeability. It combines permeability with properties of the fluid. But in any case, just think about it as a measure of how easily water can flow through a porous medium. OK, so how do geoscientists use Darcy's law and this information that I've just given you? Essentially, you can think of wells uh, as the same thing as those manometers. They fill the same role as the manometers I showed you in Darcy's experiment. So we can go out and measure the elevation of water in a well, and that tells us the hydraulic head where that water, uh, where that well is open in an aquifer. Okay. So, so we can use these measurements to help determine 
what direction groundwater is flowing in an aquifer. Okay, so in the, uh, in the illustration shown here, this simple illustration, we would conclude that groundwater is flowing from the left to the right towards well B because hydraulic head uh, decreases in that direction. And the groundwater always flows from high head to low head. Okay. <clears throat> and we can use this to help understand flow rates by assessing groundwater flow and combining it with uh, knowledge of geological properties of aquifers. We can evaluate how much water is available in aquifers and how that changes over time. Okay. How do we use this? How is this useful? Well, given the extent to which we rely on groundwater as a source of drinking water and irrigation water, this information is extremely important because it helps us manage critical water resources more effectively. Okay. This is a huge, uh, this is a big deal. It's really important. These water resources are extremely important, so we need to be able to manage them effectively. One of the examples um, that I'm going to focus on in the, in the next lecture is shown here. It is the High Plains Aquifer, okay, an aquifer that plays a vital role in sustaining human populations in the Great Plains, and an aquifer that's up against some serious challenges the, in the future. So I look forward to talking about that with you in more detail in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.